economies. But today, we see the rise in governments wanting offensive capabilities. Talk to national security leaders anywhere in the world, and they will tell you that a dollar of offense goes a lot further than a dollar of defense. So what does this mean to those of us in this room and beyond? Well, first, I think it means we have to recognize governments don't actually build their own cyber weapons. They actually exploit the protocols, applications, and platforms that you've made as a form of delivery. That's a very difficult thing to sort of think about. So this is, again, a different point in human history where governments are moving into a new space. I point out an interesting thing that occurred in the US recently. Uh, they, they just passed the defense authorization bill. And one of the curious requirements in that bill is that the Pentagon now has to tell lawmakers uh, what their stock of cyber weapons is. I found that really fascinating. Number one, that we're calling out weapons. Number two, that there's a stock. And secondly, that we're going to now talk about how those were acquired. And I think that is going to bring a shaft of light and interesting discussion in terms of how actually are those uh, exploits developed and built on top of private sector products. Today, more than 30 governments have offensive capabilities, according to the National Security uh, Director in the US. And that number will continue to grow. Governments definitely need 21st uh, century capabilities uh, to be able to mitigate and defeat the challenges that they face. But the challenge here is that cyberspace is not a physical territory. The nations uh, and the nations do not control it. It is mainly a private property that ranges from personal devices owned by individuals and enterprises to data centers and infrastructures operated by private technology companies around the world. And the methods of conflict are, are, uh, are the products that we built for office productivity, creativity, and communication. In other words, nation state military capabilities for offense deliver destruction through private sector products and public infrastructure. I think this is particularly disturbing in times of peace. The protracted aggressions constantly raise thresholds of toleration among victims over time, and this increases instability in cyberspace. We have to find a way around this. States are increasingly affirming the applicability of, the, uh, of international law, and I think that's incredibly positive. But when are we going to bring cases and hold people accountable? How will we tell others that someone violated that law? There's a lot to be done in terms of interpretation uh, of what that means. But if states are facing this problem, what does it mean for us, those of us who rely on cyberspace or make the products and services that enable it? Government offensive investments assume the private sector will always be able to patch our way back to peace and stability. I wonder if that's true when we have an increasing number of governments making investments in offense. Will that hold? And that is where I think we begin to need to have a very different kind of dialogue about what the future looks like. Code is powerful, and it's wonderful, and it is imperfect. Whether it's private sector code or whether it's government code, it's imperfect. Uh, and we've seen over the years where even uh, military entities have lost control of code, and there have been damaging effects from that. International cybersecurity is very hard. Governments have been working on solving this challenge long before it was vogue. And I applaud their efforts in that space. Diplomats have fought important and often thankless battles to get consensus on key issues, like agreement from major powers on the application of international law to cyberspace, the agreement on confidence building measures among governments, and developing norms that discourage the attacks on critical infrastructure during times of peace. But I think the lack a public-private dialogue in this space creates a risk for all of us. Sometimes governments come up with really good ideas between and among themselves, but they don't work when they go out into the real world with the technology and the innovation that we live in. Cyberspace security policy, if it has any hope of, of growing into a sustainable international framework, is going to have to be developed with a broader public-private dialogue. I'm a realist. Governments are not suddenly going to stop creating military capabilities in cyber. But we can and should understand the risks that, that 
that creates and the instability that could result. And we need to work together to figure out how we're going to increase an emphasis on defense. In February of this year, we introduced this idea of a digital Geneva Convention, not because we didn't think international law was sufficient, or not that we didn't think that things like the Tallinn Manual were important. In part, it was to take us to another level of dialogue and get a broader sense of the things that we needed to do to protect cyberspace and the people who rely on it. We raised some ideas, um, uh, and certainly there are lots of ideas that should be brought to the table, but one of these were simple things like government should actually have a principle-based policy for how they will deal with vulnerabilities. In some cases, you see this emerging as vulnerability equities processes. Why do we think that's a good idea? Well, it forces governments to actually have a discussion outside of the military scope to the other elements of government to say, is this the right thing for offense, or would we benefit more from releasing this vulnerability so it could be fixed through defense? Um, those are important conversations and ones we need to encourage as we go around the world. Other things that we put on there for people to think about were ideas around how governments think about perhaps exercising restraint in not developing uh, weapons of mass disruption or making sure that when weapons were built, they were precise and not reusable. So we're not always having to live with code that's running around the world uh, impacting our customers. I think it's also important to think about the fact that when you're looking at mass ICT products and the global platforms, that's really not a place that you want to try to insert back doors. Oh, it sounds really cool, but the effects of that, I don't think we really understand uh, the systemic effects that could come from that. There's not enough modeling in the world to really understand that, and there hasn't been a rich enough discussion to try to understand the implications of that. We also raised some other ideas in terms of what we could do together uh, to prevent things like malicious code. How could you reduce that? How could you make sure that certs were not uh, uh, disrupted when trying to respond to things? I think there are many ideas that could be put forward. Uh, the other one was also how do we sort of pull back and refrain from attacking journalists and the elements of democracy and democratic institutions around the world? How do we have non-interference in that space in cyber? I'd leave you with a final thought. Reducing the chance for cyber conflict is not something that is the sole domain of nation states. Not when the mode and method of conflict belongs to those of us in this room. The security and stability of cyberspace will always depend on a multi-stakeholder community. We need to assert ourselves that we're not here just to clean up things. We should be driving a broader public debate about how we advance the interpretation of international law and promote meaningful risk reduction strategies that protect people online and in the real world. And so with that, I you know, encourage you to take a look at some of the things we put forward in the Digital Geneva Convention. It's very much an idea uh, and one that needs to be built on and changed and interacted with and new ideas uh, put out on the table in contrast to it. Great, thank you. Thank you, Paul, for that kind of opening framing, both of the, the story of how we got here and some of the proposals that your company has made. Uh, ben, I wonder if we can turn to you. Um, the OSCE, in terms of the international relations space, was one of the first kind of on the scene to, to reach some uh, agreement on confidence building measures, has played in the normative space. So I wonder if you can kind of offer your perspective on this uh, and extending the conversation. Thanks. Thank you, Duncan, and a uh, big thank you also to Microsoft for inviting the OC to contribute to this important panel. And also, this is my first time at the IGF, and I'm very excited to be here, though I'm very critical of the room setup because it feels like we're in silos, <laughs> and this is exactly what we're trying to prevent. Um, 2017, I think we can all agree, was a tough year for international cyber policy. Um, I believe that states moved further apart in their uh, approaches and hardened their stance when it comes to um, what needs to be done to promote cyber stability between states. And I therefore commend Microsoft for their contributions to this policy field and trying to push the boat forward, so to say, and to give fresh impetus 
to our thinking when it comes to what needs to be done to promote a peaceful uh, cyberspace for us all. And certainly I believe that you give vital input to processes not only at the OC but also at the UN and uh, this is something we should listen to um, in our deliberations. Um, as Duncan said, the OCE has been focusing on this field for some time now, since 2013, and our participating states, which very much span the northern hemisphere of uh, the globe, uh, from Vancouver to Vladivostok, as we want to say, uh, often, have come up with a unique set of measures designed to uh, reduce the risk of conflict stemming from the use of information communication technologies by states. And essentially, uh, these are tools to prevent an escalation of tensions uh, through misattribution or pointing the finger at uh, someone uh, erroneously in the heat of the moment. And what we have established or what we're establishing are crisis communication mechanisms between states that allow states to recover or to stop a spiral of escalation through the use of cyber means. Um, so our work is closely related to the norms debate in the sense that we are operationalizing and socializing these norms. We are there when norms are broken or international law is broken because you will need those mechanisms that allow you to get in contact with each other to de-escalate. And these need to be negotiated and they need to be step-by-step -step mechanisms. So in a sense, uh, through this practice, we are contributing to customary law almost uh, and establishing hopefully a good practice that then can be carried on uh, for greater purpose and looking at more of the legal frameworks and, uh, and normative debates. Um, with regard to the Digital Geneva Convention, I think this is a fantastic document that uh, brings up the right questions and maybe some questions that we still need to answer. I think, as uh, Paul said, the bottom line is use, the use of uh, ICTs, information communication technologies, or cyber means by states, will proliferate in the future. And investments in ever more sophisticated cyber, uh, uh, cyber capabilities, be it for defensive or offensive purposes, will also continue. And that makes this fact alone underscores the importance uh, to clarify how international law applies to this domain, to develop norms, rules, and principles of responsible state behavior in cyberspace, as well as measures uh, to uh, prevent conflict stemming from the use of ICTs. And it also, of course, validates what Microsoft is trying to do with the Digital Geneva Convention, looking at uh, whether we need a more legally binding tool in the future that uh, is based on the multi-stakeholder um, uh, approach. The problem, or the two fundamental questions I have, is A, is there political will on the state level to engage in these discussions at the moment? And B, what happens if these regimes or this thinking or whatever we're trying to get to uh, fails to deliver and they uh, break down? International law is broken every day. There's no news. Uh, to think that that will be any different when it comes to cyber, I think we need to be realistic. We also need to address the question why a state should feel bound by any norm, code, or agreement if it does not have the confidence that another state will apply the same principles. And that leads me directly to the attribution challenge. Previous regimes, when it comes to the kinetic world, had mechanisms to verify discretions. And it was quite easy but for states to do so. When it comes to cyber, this is a bit more difficult, and that's why I also commend Microsoft's work on attribution, because this is something that we need to focus on much more. I guess my key point is that principles, norms, and legal frameworks need to be underpinned by practical measures that create the conditions for such frameworks to function in practice. And this starts with questions of attribution and ends with discussions on sanctions and in between an array of other highly sensitive issues. The question will be though, will states be interested in discussing this with each other? And at the moment we have somewhat challenges with this, let alone with sectors that ultimately are also involved in cybersecurity, the private sector. 
and that fundamentally, the bottom line is that we have a trust issue still, and it's growing. And that is something we need to address, not only between states, but also between states and the private sector, and also civil society, but I would also say between the private sector, private to private sector cooperation. This is why I commend Microsoft and the work on their tech accord. What we had in the past was very much, absolutely we need a multi-stakeholder approach. But who manages it? Who is driving it? Who are the key participants? Is everyone gonna sit at a table? Are we gonna have every company sitting on the table discussing this? Where are the limitations to such a framework? How do we implement it? Who implements it? Who sanctions it? So there are a lot of questions in practice. If we want to get meaningful about a multi-stakeholder approach and a legal uh, framework to this that we need to address. At the same time, we also need to not forget that things have been agreed. As uh, was pointed out, there is agreement on some norms of behavior. The problem is, are they implemented between states? Are they understood? Can everyone gather around these norms? How do we socialize them? So there's a capacity building um, uh, dimension to this as well. And as I said, we need to think about suitable platforms for multi-stakeholder approaches if we want to implement new treaties and frameworks. Classical multilateral platforms have not been created for multi-stakeholder purposes. The UN has been signed for states. The OC is a state platform. And many states feel that it's them who are ultimately responsible for security. Of course, with the cyberspace, we are dealing with a new domain, whether there is, that's not quite true anymore, as we heard before. But again, structurally, how do we deal with this problem? I find it hard to imagine that everyone can sit at the table because there's gonna be a global framework. So these are some of the um, things that we need to answer. And I'm looking forward to discussing this. And again, commend Microsoft for their thinking. We certainly uh, feel that uh, you have a lot to contribute also to our work. And with that, I leave it. And thank you for the opportunity again to contribute to this panel. Thank you, Ben. Um, I, I, I think the two questions you raised, you have raised more than two questions, but the two that struck out for me was the, the political will question of how do you move a process forward if states are reluctant, and the question of uh, effectiveness or violations, uh, you know, what happens if the law is violated, are things I hope we can return to when we get to the, to the broader roundtable discussion and, and also bring in folks in the room and online. But first, I wanna give Konstantinos an opportunity to offer a uh, perspective from the Internet Society's viewpoint. Thank you very much, Duncan. Uh, hello, everyone, and uh, good morning. Um, I would also like to thank Microsoft for uh, kindly extending an invitation to the Internet Society. And for those of you who are not familiar, ISOC is uh, a global uh, non-governmental organization that for the past 24 years works uh, for an Internet that is open, uh, uh, global, and secure for everyone. So this is a, a cybersecurity, certainly one of those uh, areas that we certainly focus on. And I think uh, before uh, I start, I, I also personally would like to thank Microsoft for bringing this conversation to the forefront. I think that for the past uh, few years, uh, cybersecurity conversations in particular were reserved in, perhaps in this, in the, between us, uh, but right now, I, my mother even talks about cybersecurity uh, and the problems that are there and the fears, of course, that people have when they're using the Internet. Um, I think that I, I am not... Uh, of course, the, the issue is very complex and we have a very concrete uh, proposal. However, I would like to take it a little bit perhaps beyond Microsoft and just elevate it uh, a little bit in the three elements that are, however, in the proposal. The idea of a treaty, the attribution, uh, and also um, the, the tech accord, the idea of norms between the technical community, and offer some, uh, a few points. So this, this space, and we are all used to talk a lot about multi-stakeholder, and I think the multi-stakeholder model, and I'm, I don't think we need to depart from talking and insisting that uh, the application of the multi-stakeholder model also in this uh, context. Treaties are complex, they are very slow, but ultimately they're reserved for governments. They happen behind closed doors, normally, 
and um, they then just present the results that, they, that we are asked to follow uh, and the rules that we're asked to abide by. Uh, so it, it would be very, it would be a step backwards, especially when we're talking about issues of cyberspace, not to include all those other stakeholders that really have a very valuable input, especially the technical community that is already working in identifying solutions uh, to the security challenges that we're facing um, in cyberspace. Um, but more importantly, we have seen, and I think that uh, it was a comment that was made by my uh, by the previous colleagues, that currently governmental processes also do not seem to work. We saw that the, at the level of the UNGGE that things have sort of stopped. Uh, the government seemed to have gone as far as they could go, uh, and that is a good indication and poses the question of why, what would, make, what would be the difference in this case to see a treaty actually being fulfilled and actually reaching the results uh, that we want. So from where we are sitting, we believe that uh, we need to give an opportunity to more inclusive processes like the GCSC uh, that to come up uh, with norms that are able to answer a lot of the questions uh, and solve a lot of the problems that currently uh, we are facing as an international community in the context of cyberspace. And they just came up actually uh, out with their first norm. Uh, and we need to provide them uh, the space and the time to start developing, the, uh, start developing more norms and see how we can actually move to the enforcement of those uh, norms to uh, the, uh, the wider range of stakeholders. Um, in terms of uh, attribution, uh, I've had a long discussion with uh, the technical community about this with some people, and I think we need to differentiate. Attribution is we need to have something like that. Uh, there needs to happen. We need to know who is behind those attacks. Uh, but there are two elements. There is the political element of attribution, then there is the pure technical element of attribution. And there are some if you want nuances, especially in the technical idea of attribution, uh, w that I'm not sure how much we take them into consideration. For example, we do not always know who is behind the attack. We might be able to identify the network that the attack originated from, but we do not know who behind, who is actually behind uh, this attack. And there is, and. Uh, to, Sharing and uh, the, it's not clear also whether we will see private networks sharing that information, right? I mean, we need to, uh, th this networks on the internet are private, they're based on voluntary agreements, and we are not there uh, yet sure whether we, we will see this voluntarism take place in order to share that information uh, from uh, the networks themselves. And last but not least, and I will end here, uh, when it comes to the Tech Accord, I think that this is, this is a very good thing for the technical community to come together and actually come up with norms that are able to answer, um, to, uh, to answer a lot of the questions and bring everyone together, but I would make the suggestion that this needs to go beyond the technical, uh, just the tech industry. There are technical organizations li uh, out there, like the ITF, for example, that are currently working on fixing and answering many of these problems. Uh, so including them and making them part of this conversation uh, is certainly crucial. Thanks. Thank you, Constantinos. And I, I certainly echo the idea that um, Particularly in something like a treaty, we have this tendency to think it's states only, but I think particularly in this space, it's worth noting the role that non-state actors can play. And it's not that there haven't been treaties in the past. One only has to look to the nuclear ban treaty this summer to see a treaty that was sponsored and pushed and advocated for by a multi-stakeholder community, civil society, and others that then leads states to action. So it doesn't always have to be states that take the lead. Um, I'd like to now kind of turn for the next half hour or so to uh, kind of a round table, bringing in uh, Yvette and... Uh, Maria and El uh, Elena's views as well as those who've already spoken. And I've kind of posed to our, 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 our folks here uh, four questions. And the, the first question is about this idea of offensive cyber capabilities. That is, how have governments or malicious actors been using these cyber capabilities in recent years? And what are the drivers and enablers behind the use of these cyber weapons? Or, or more simply put, you know, what's the effects of what seems to be an increasingly militarized cyberspace 
Uh, and so I'd open that up uh, to, to get some views from those of you who've either not yet spoken or those of you who have spoken to kind of, kind of to frame, the, as I said, the status quo at the outset. Why do we feel uh, that I couldn't get a single hand raised in this room that said that, you know, that you're happy with the state of global cybersecurity? So. Well, actually, the first point that I would like to make in response to your, to your question is that I think that we desperately need more evidence-based research on this field because we have numbers that have been thrown and put on the table on how many states have cyber capabilities, and they vary a lot from 30 to 100, and we are not sure. And I think that it's uh, very important to build policy based on sound evidence. Um, Diplo Foundation made a small contribution to build evidence this week. We have developed a map in which we investigated and the countries that have uh, cyber capabilities. We identified 20 countries that, uh, in which we found evidence because they mentioned that in their cyber strategies or they pack um, cyber capabilities of offensive uh, nature inside their defensive strategies. And nine countries in which we found strong indication coming from reliable sources such as the technical community uh, or reputed media sources that countries have indicated to have offensive capabilities. So my first um, point in reaction to your question would be the need to develop evidence-based research on this area. Um, so I think it's interesting, your, your question on, you know, what are the enablers and drivers of, of offensive capabilities? I think, um, you know, the world is going through this sort of profound uh, digital transformation at the moment. You can access and touch on. So, oh, uh, you can attack and uh, impact people in ways that you never could before because more and more everything we're doing is based on code. Even traditional enterprises today view themselves as software companies. So, that one of the drivers is there's this new ability to reach into that space. Uh, and then secondly, um, there was a comment from the NSA director, I think in his spring testimony this year, that I thought was rather disturbing. He talked about the fact that as new powers uh, or emerging cyber powers came online, they would oftentimes have parity, perhaps, with their competitors. And they may actually be more likely to take uh, um, sort of first strike options in that space. And that may actually contribute to a, a more instability at the international level. So I do think we need to watch those things, and I, I totally uh, agree with a colleague from the Diplo Foundation. We need, we need a lot more research in this space. If you look around, it's really hard to find data. Right. Um, good question. Where are we at when it comes to offensive cyber capabilities? I think Certainly this year, I think we have seen, well, A, I completely agree with, our, uh, with the speaker before that we need to better research in terms of classifying and uh, identifying what are actually um, offensive um, tools that have been used. But I would also say that um, by design and using cyberspace, there's actually some level of restraint by states using those capabilities because once obviously you use them, those attack vectors are out in the open. So you need to be doing a good job to um, prevent that. What I think we've seen this year is a bit of shift away from use of developing offensive capabilities to more low cost solutions, exploiting vulnerabilities, existing vulnerabilities. I think that's a bit of a shift away that we see that uh, that becomes more and more attractive, so rather than investing loads uh, of money into like very sophisticated capabilities, I think we will see more and more the use of vulnerabilities of existing products uh, that have not been patched and kind of try to th use those vulnerabilities to, to maximum effect. And I think this is something we will likely uh, see in the future um, rather than this kind of uh, massive investment in the uh, attack uh, capabilities. And that will also make it easier for states that probably do not have the R&D to, um, to uh, be part of the game. So less Stuxnet, more not Petya sort of wanna cry uh, models. I think that, that does seem to bear witness to what we've seen in 2017. Um, so I, keeping mindful of the time, and I do wanna get to the rest of the folks in the room, I'd like to shift then to the second question which we had was um, uh, taking the point that we probably need to keep an eye on both 
how we research and think about the status quo on the facts on the ground, so to speak, or the facts on the virtual ground, uh, and the, the way to characterize these threats. What about the normative conversation? Where are we in terms of how has the conversation evolved? And here when I say norms, I'm including both legal norms, those based in international law, as well as maybe what we call you know, political norms, those that aren't necessarily resting on international law but are found and accepted by states or other uh, stakeholders as appropriate expectations for their behavior. I, I, I'm kind of interested to get a view from, from all of you is are we, you know, how ref reflective are these normative trends in terms of governing this space, particularly the offensive capabilities we've just talked about in the broader threat landscape. So I'd invite uh, comments from the group. Uh, on this, uh, this potential, you know, do we see gaps in the normative uh, environment or do we think that it's just a matter of time but we're getting there? So I'd be interested to take the, the, the temperature. I, I work in a think tank in Southeast Asia and I'd like to offer a bit of a reality check from that region. Um, what we often hear, I'd like to also throw out three words for your consideration and these words and the ideas behind them have sort of been floating around the discussion that we've already heard from the panel. Um, and they seem a bit waffly, but they're what underpin a lot of um, conversations and concerns surrounding this discussion on uh, offensive capabilities and militarization of cyberspace and whether we need an accord. Those words are rules, power, and values. Uh, what we often hear in Southeast Asia and the wider Asia Pacific is this call for a rules-based order. And certainly we need rules that guide state conduct in cyberspace and perhaps there's room for an accord uh, that comes from the tech community, from companies like Microsoft that provide this intellectual leadership to shape those rules. But whose rules are we talking about? And this is a question that often gets asked in Asia because the landscape of rules seem to be changing. Uh, what is known as the status quo is being challenged, as some powers feel. Um, whose rules will be more important to the region, to the world, in the next five years, in the next 50 years? And that's, uh, that's an important consideration. It might seem a little distant, but uh, this is something that countries in Southeast Asia, for example, are thinking about. Which gets me to the point about power. Uh, Southeast Asia being a conglomerate, if you will, of smaller countries uh, are very aware that um, the strong do what they will and countries like us, the weaker ones, suffer what they must. And so there is a pragmatism that underpins discussions of uh, capabilities in cyberspace in Southeast Asia. These rules that we talk about are being shaped by those with capabilities, those with sophisticated technology, and those with power. What do countries like my own Malaysia do uh, in an event where there might be a subversive use of exploits for quote unquote national security purposes which are arguably permissible in international law um, that eventually compromise our own information infrastructure for example because you could argue that that in itself would amount to an attack. Um, a third word is values. We often hear from our end uh, this talk about how democratic ideals need, need to be preserved. And that's all well and good. Nothing wrong with democracy. But in Southeast Asia and uh, within the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, we are a grouping of many different government systems and ideals. We may not always agree with them. Uh, we may feel differently about absolute monarchies or communist systems. But we respect that governance so long as that there are good mechanisms of governance. So this question of promoting, advancing, protecting democratic ideals in um, any kind of accord or a norms discussion is quite troubling to people in the region. You might not like it, but that's the state of play. So I'll leave it at that. Uh, thank you, Duncan. I think um, from my perspective, I believe that um, there have been a lot of norms or norms that have been agreed on by, um, by states but also thrown out by initiatives such as the Global Commission and also by Microsoft and they all have their value and uh, are important and are, uh, have their place. Um, the challenge will be 
implementation and how do we measure success and what happens if it doesn't happen, so to say. Uh, I think we need to focus much more on these questions. Um, if we don't want to have just a proliferation of norms, we need to see well what happens with them. And I think uh, that we need to invest more energy and time into answering that question. Um, and I speak a bit from experience from my own organization, and that's just between states and uh, just a group of uh, a smaller group of states, 57 states. Um, there's agreement on what needs to be done to promote transparency and cooperation in cyberspace, and agreement has been reached. The challenge is implementation and the political will to implement. Because ultimately, when it comes to implementation, you also have to open up a bit more. And that, the question is, do you want to at this moment? Do you feel secure enough to open up to other states, to the private sector, about what you can or cannot do? Implementation is where the crux is, in my opinion. And uh, we need to think about mechanisms not only to implement and promote implementation, but also how to measure whether implementation has been successful. So kind of almost coming up with performance uh, key indicators. Uh, when do we consider a norm implemented? Um, and I think that's where the debate has to uh, shift now as well to while continuing to talk about uh, and uh, coming up with norms. Um, just oh. Maria, then Paul. Thank you. I would like to go back to the point of power because I think it's a very important um, remark that you have made. We know that in a scenario of real politics, international relations, uh, international law protects the weaker states from the stronger states. And I think that in this scenario that we are, international law, a treaty, would do a great deal to protect human rights and multi-stakeholder involvement. Because I believe that one day we will see a major disruption happening. And if this happens, then who will kick in to solve the problem? It will be national security, it will be the military, and these people will not probably call other stakeholders for a consultation. They will want to deal with a crisis. So the responses that will elab be elaborated in this moment probably will not have human rights at the forefront. We have an opportunity now to anticipate ourselves and to build frameworks that involve other stakeholders as we are talking uh, about now, and it's extremely important, and also to develop frameworks that take human rights into account. But we cannot do that in a moment of crisis. We can only do that in a moment of peace. That is why I believe I didn't hear anyone saying that a treaty would be undesirable. People say that it would be too hard, too difficult, too long to elaborate a treaty, and I agree. But if, if it's too hard and too long, then we should start now, not next year, not the year after. So we should just roll up our sleeves and, and, and get to work, because this is something that sooner or later will be necessary, and we can do it the right way, uh, incorporating the safeguards that we need if we start it now. Oh, great. Uh, just a, a follow-up on both uh, comments. One, in terms of moving forward on norms, it, it would almost be interesting to see if we could fail fast. Could, could we try something and see if it actually works to build momentum? I, it, sometimes it feels like in the international dialogue, we, we, you know, we, we try to build something that's absolutely perfect and negotiated. And, but it, sometimes you have to try things, and they're going to fail. Uh, nobody has an answer here. And that would be actually learning. And, and to Maria's point, it's better that we learn those things now than when we're in a crisis. And I think that's the part uh, that concerns a lot of people who are in the you know, private sector and civil society about how, how are we going to do that in a time of crisis. Th uh, thanks. Just very briefly, um, I am not sure that there is an agreement necessarily, not amongst the panel, but a global agreement about where things are. And uh, there are still. Uh, valid questions that are asked and we need to uh, answer them. Uh, going back to your original question, Duncan, I think that by now we have realized that international law sure has its, the application of international law in this space uh, has its challenges. This is not new for the past 25 years. We have found uh, challenges in applying international or national law, but there are really valid questions that we need to go back and see and identify the gaps and see whether we can fill the gaps within the international uh, law framework. Uh, uh, things like, you know, what constitutes a cyber th 
threat or an attack and who should be afforded, uh, in that case, rights and protection under international law is something that we do not have an answer uh, yet. And I know that the Commission is one of the things that the Commission uh, is uh, talking about. Um, also, we seem to be rejecting outright the idea that cyber operations are not regulated by uh, international law. and. This is not necessarily the case. For example, cyber operations in armed conflicts must comply with existing humanitarian law. We know that. So there, there we have a case where international law can provide some sort of an answers. And there is the technical expertise that is coming in, whether it is from Microsoft and also other organizations, uh, technical organization, is important because it informs uh, assessments of the poten potential return costs of cyber operations and the need for new rules. Um, so all these discussions are critical in answering those questions of whether there are open areas of law that need interpretation and whether they are, this is what we need to focus perhaps primarily in trying to fill in those areas instead of going and creating whole new legal frameworks that we really do not know which way they're going to go. Thank you. Uh, I would like to come back to um, the comment made by our colleague from the Diplo Foundation, kind of the desirable of a treaty um, in order to protect also human rights and to enshrine certain um, um, co to kind of codify good, good behavior. Um, I agree that in the long run, such a document is desirable. I wonder in the current climate whether it is conducive to come up with a document that is that will cover all this also given that states have fundamentally different um, approaches to the question and, and place different value on different issues uh, here comes of course the kind of whole dialogue about fundamental freedoms versus security and uh, different weighting of uh, states i doubt though that this treaty will look into the practical things on the national level and uh, that will be done very much as a national decision, how you react to this and how uh, capable you are, uh, for instance, to connect your technical community and your policymakers in terms of reacting to a significant cyber incident. And I would argue that that is already actually being dealt with. I mean, look at, uh, for instance, the work we are doing, CBMs. That's very much the core of our work. It's about organizing national structures and mechanisms so you can actually deal with such an incident as a part of building confidence as being a good cyber neighbor, I guess. Um, it, it very much exercises those channels of communication. Um, so I would say that uh, we don't have time <laughs> actually to look at these issues uh, for a treaty and that while the treaty is desirable, I think we're looking quite a distant future and that there are a lot of things that we need to do now that are not being addressed specifically on the practical level and, and implementation there already is actually quite challenging um, because it becomes quite politicized, even that. So thank you. So just a couple of tying things together. I think uh, Alina, your point about rules, power and values is in imperative. Like I think that's always lurking. I think one of the questions of course is that that's a question not just with respect to doing something new, but it's a, a question with respect to where are we today? What are the rules? Where is the power and where are the values without some new proposal, whether it's a treaty or, as Ben suggests, other more practical and concrete measures moving forward. Um, Constantinos, I think the, uh, you raise, again, this question of international law and how it applies. At least from my own perspective as an international lawyer, a treaty lawyer, it's never been that does international law apply. I think it does. It clearly, international law applies to these. It's more a question of effectiveness. That is, is international law doing what it's set out to do in this space. And that's, I think, one of the things that maybe gives rise to these conversations we're having. And of course, uh, as Ben's kind of reminded us a couple of times, there is this question uh, of the states who are not on this <coughs> dais, that what is their perspective and how much do we wait for states to say they're ready to do something versus is this a moment where other stakeholders in a multi-stakeholder community push states uh, to change uh, their behavior. So I, I, we have a few more minutes for the roundtable piece, and I want to focus uh, on this question of the, the treaty idea, the treaty, international treaty, um, how they can play a role in securing stability in cyberspace. In particular, are there parallels where we've seen other examples, whether of 
treaties or other normative institutions that suggest to us that global governance can work. So I'm curious to know, um, first of all, are there any precedents that we haven't talked about that we think we might want to talk about? And then also uh, views from the, the, the round table before I close this portion out on the concrete idea of a treaty going forward. And then I'll open it up to the room. But Yvette, maybe I'll, uh, Yvette, I'll let you weigh in because you've been patiently waiting. Uh, thanks, Duncan, and I'd also like to thank Microsoft for the opportunity to be on this panel. Um, I'm not, I'm from, my background is um, an international lawyer, and I study specifically the generation of norms um, by non-state actors uh, in international law, so I find this um, panel really interesting. Um, I agree very much with what um, has been said by the other members on the panel about more research needing to be done, not only in terms of what the offensive capabilities are, not only in terms, as others have mentioned, on what the gaps are, but also about who should be involved um, and how. So the, um, because there are important ownership questions um, and ownership of norms has been linked to greater compliance of them. Um, in terms of the effectiveness of a digital Geneva Convention idea as a treaty, personally, outs coming from outside the cybersecurity framework, um, I'm convinced that there isn't a single solution to, um, to regulate the problem of malicious use of cyber tools. Um, I think we're going to be looking at a global web of, me of measures, a uh, safety net of sorts, um, that's going to involve different levels uh, and different actors. Um, and the solutions are going to need to range from formal to informal, voluntary to binding, uh, governmental to non-governmental, domestic to international. So uh, I think um, we, we said before that um, it's, a, it's a big challenge, it's a big game, but that doesn't mean we can't move incrementally. And there are examples, I think, of initiatives, um, and I'm going to talk about initiatives in two distinct fields of international law. Uh, the first um, is arms control or disarmament treaties, and the second, um, business and human rights multi-stakeholder initiatives. Um, and both of these areas touch on sort of specific challenges of the cybersecurity problem. I mean, um, the cybersecurity issue um, sort of manifests kind of in both, uh, in both of these areas. And we have seen in the past different initiatives that have involved different kinds of actors and different kinds of processes, and we've made progress on building norms. And some of them have been more effective than others at some things. Um, and I think this whole um, discussion and, and the question of a treaty or regulatory mechanism begs a whole series of other questions, which we're going to have to answer before we can decide what mechanisms are appropriate. Um, just for example, what do you want to control? Are we looking at controlling tools, software, malware, actors, effects, capabilities? Um, and answers to those questions determine the types of mechanisms that are going to be appropriate. Um, are we looking at establishing basic rules of behavior? If so, for what actors? Um, are we looking at technology control, non-proliferation? And if it's non-proliferation, between whom? Uh, is it state to state, non-state actor, state uh, between non-state actors? <laughs> Um, and also then, what kinds, of, um, what kinds of norms are envisaged? Are we looking at, I mean, and we're looking at different processes, and different processes will be looking at different regulatory norms. So by regulatory, I mean um, behavior that's sanctioned or condoned, prescriptive norms, um, which prescribe behavior that you should take, um, constitutive norms, like uh, constituting a new attribution mechanism. So I'll just say before I start speaking, if I can still go on, if, um, that instead of thinking only about multilateral um, agreements, we shouldn't forget the role of bilateral and regional agreements, and also the role of soft law processes. Um, in, the, in the field of disarmament, I'll just quickly give you um, example uh, examples of processes that I think that this discussion could learn from. Um, when in the early, late 90s, early 2000s, traditional disarmament machinery became stuck, um, there was a reframing that happened that took the discussion of issues outside of an arms control perspective and into a humanitarian perspective, which allowed uh, actors to shift the uh, to shift the frame of their discussion, which meant that 
finally civil society could really be involved and um, the public sector could be engaged, so public opinion was mobilized. And it also meant that different people were in the rooms quite simply discussing. So we weren't talking amongst arms control diplomats, but we were talking to um, different actors within, uh, within administrations. Um, and our, as a result of this reframing, and I'm just giving a very brief overview, um, I see people who have been involved in some of these exercises in the room, and I ex excuse me for the pressy. Uh, as a result of this reframing, the international community got a range of treaties, and um, starting with the 1997 Mine Ban Treaty, um, going on to the Cluster Munitions Convention, um, the Arms Trade Treaty, which regulates the trade in conventional weapons, and then the recently signed, and everyone saw the, the Nuclear Ban Treaty, which uh, we have just been seen the Nobel Prize being given for. These treaties have a range of features that I think might inform um, your discussion. So they, they include restrictions that are quite comprehensive in some cases. So you're talking about restrictions on use, development, acquisition, stockpiling, production, transfer, and also provisions on destruction of um, capabilities that have already been amassed. Um, they also include provisions to clear contamination, to ed uh, engage in risk reduction, implementation and monitoring mechanisms. Many of them set up implement implementation support units or verification bodies. Uh, there are also clear provisions on victim assistance and capacity building, uh, international cooperation and assistance. Um, some of these treaties, in particular the Mine Ban Treaty, um, have been accompanied by non-state actor processes. So the Mine Ban Treaty happened in 2007 and then in, uh, in, in 1997 and then in 2000, an NGO decided to take up the problem of use not only by states but by non-state actors. So these non-state actors have been able to commit themselves to parallel norms um, um, to, uh, to prohibit the use of, of landmines. And so those, those are interesting processes that you could also um, learn from. I, I will try to give, okay, I'll speak a little bit also then about the human rights, um, the human rights side. So basically, in the late 90s, early 2000s, again around the same time, there was um, recognition that there were problems in terms of how the interaction between states, governments, and private citizens uh, were happening with regards to human rights protection for uh, protection of human rights for um, people who are being impacted by businesses. And it wasn't clear what the regime was. And through a whole bunch of consultative processes, we came up in 2000, and I think it was 11, with the, I'm sorry, I have a whole bunch of examples here for you with the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. And these are a result of um, an incredibly long consultative process that was multi-stakeholder. And the principles themselves are not binding. They simply clarify what states' obligations are. Um, however, they make their way into other binding documents. So they've found their way into uh, ISO standards, OECD documents, EU regulations. And that's another way to move forward instead of looking towards the treaty, there are other ways that might happen faster um, and that would translate into more formal processes as time went on. And I'll let other people speak. So, yeah, so Yvette, thank you very much. I do think that the, the Ruggy Principles offers an alternative path in terms of uh, a multi-stakeholder setting and working towards some norms but it's not state-driven. And I think that the role of civil society and the tail, whether it's the Landmines Convention or the recent Nuke Ban Treaty, two Nobel Peace Prizes have been awarded, not to the states who negotiated the treaty, but those in civil society and elsewhere that push states to say, you know, this is not an acceptable, you need to move on this, is a question, at least, that needs to be asked in this context. Are we yet at that point where there should be pressure put on states? Or should, as some suggest, more room be given to states to work out amongst themselves uh, what their, their views are. Um, those of you in the room have been re remarkably patient. I'm going to ask you to be patient for a minute more because I want to actually see if we have any um, uh, views from the remote participants who've kind of been watching uh, us. And, and I give the first question uh, to, to, uh, to the remote participants. Thank you, Duncan. Excellent discussion. Um, there were a couple of comments on Twitter and, uh, and uh, in the room. Uh, so I'll take two, and then we have another one for later, probably. Uh, the first two is, uh, Michael said um, in his introduction, 
Duncan made analogies to agreements to end slavery and ban privateers, but isn't the Geneva, uh, Digital Geneva Convention more like the disarmament, uh, disarmament treaties of the 20s, uh, which were hard to monitor and easy to evade? And then a hashtag was, didn't stop Hitler. Um, and then the question from the room was um, uh, by Sonia. She said, uh, following Mr. Hiller's comment, that there needs to be a political will of states to engage how realistic is it um, that we can see a cyber treaty anytime soon? So those are two, two questions, one on effectiveness, the other one on reality, and there is another one on a substance, but I'll save it for later. Well, I, I, I'll take the moderator's privilege and, and respond on the substantive one that was directed. I, you know, I take the, the point about the what's the right analogy for this. Um, I would say um, kellogg Briand, the treaty that banned warfare, is one of the most maligned treaties out there. Um, but there's been recent work, there's a book called The Internationalists by Ona Hathaway and Scott Shapiro that actually suggests, you know, if we look, the world has changed. You know, in the 19th century, states used, went to war as a matter of course. They didn't have to think about it. Um, if you, your country, your, your nationals were owed debts, you would send in the Marines and the like. And today, those of you who've worked for governments know that it's quite different, that if you want to use force today, you're going to have to articulate a rationale for it, whether under Security Council authorization or in some framework of self-defense. Um, and so as much as we like to malign uh, the ineffectiveness of law, we might also you know, say that the glass is half full rather than half empty and that we do live in a different world, not a perfect world, but a different world where states are in some sense constrained about their use of force, maybe not as much as we'd like. And so I do think, you know, that's the international law professor, me, I apologize. Um, but, you know, to respond, I do think the question of effectiveness is always an easy one for the critics of the law to throw at the law because law is not a perfect panacea. It doesn't solve all problems. And so um, we could look at the law today and find many problems with it. But that's at least my response. I don't know if others have response is to either that question or the other question from the remote participants. Just one on timeline. I, I, I do think it's going to take quite a long time. I, we have a lot of dialogue and discussion uh, and analysis that has yet to be done in this space, and I think you, nothing is going to happen in the short term. Okay, thanks. All right, I'd like to open up to the room, and I see some folks that have been patiently waiting. I'm going to start here, move here, and then move there, and we'll go from there. But please, and please um, remember to introduce yourself, and in the interest of time, hopefully a comment or a question that um, uh, is appreciative of the fact that there are a lot of views that want to be expressed. Un understood. Slightly awkward seating, as one of the panelists mentioned. It would be nice to be able to stand in front of the room and actually redress the multi-stakeholder nature of the panel. Um, I'm Toby Feakin. I'm the Ambassador for Cyber Affairs for Australia, so I'm one of those governments that you've been talking about um, so clearly in your session. And I feel if you'll just allow me just to talk a little bit about an Australian perspective on what you've been saying today. Um, we really do value the multi-stakeholder approach. It's one of the cores of, of how we view cyber affairs. Um, and, and it's vital that we have that in consideration when, when we're looking at the future of the internet and looking at the future of what governments do online. But I need to redress some of the um, discussion that's been here. It, we forget that the UN Group of Government Experts has had a great deal of success, and it would be unforgiving of all of us if we forgot that in 2015 we agreed as a group of states that there are 11 norms that apply in cyberspace. We put that. Sorry. I'm being asked yeah, just by the remote it, moderators to, it, if you can, I know it's not a difficult room. I would prefer to stand in front of the room, to be frank, and say this, just so there's a bit more projection. But, you know, we have 11 norms in the 2015 UN Group of Government Experts. We as a government have published those in the back of our international cyber engagement strategy to show our firm commitment to those norms that have been there. It's not as if a lot of nations are trying to shy away from our agreements. It's just that there are some that do. And unfortunately, those some that do are the ones that we really need to be looking at and addressing in the future. So if we shy away from those norms, we actually, and begin inventing plenty of new norms, we then lose ground in terms of the really good work that's being done. We think that's important. We've agreed that international law applies, including the entirety of the UN Charter in the 2013 UNGG. And we publish all of this in the back of our strategy to make sure that as a government, you see our firm commitment um, to those agreements that have been put in place. Um, we talk about offensive cyber capability. We're very transparent about that. We've said probably more than any other country about our offensive capability. We don't do that to militarize cyberspace. 
we do that for the exact opposite reason, which is would you prefer that that conversation doesn't happen at all and it remains in the shadows? Because there are certain countries that won't talk about it. But we put that there in order to show that we're a responsible state actor who act in accordance with international law and norms. And so putting that out there and trying to push the discussion more out into the open is what a responsible state does. And it's our job to try and push other states into that position so that we can have a more rational conversation. And finally, just for a treaty, I do fear, be careful what you wish for because it might come true. We might end up in decades long of discussion about what a treaty should look like. By the time we agree it, technologies will be completely different. Um, we will be in a state whereby during those decades long of, of treaty negotiation, that malicious actors will have exploited that gray space far further than you've seen so far. So be careful what you wish for, I would say that. And think about the normative discussion and how we universalize those. How do we make them applicable to those states who maybe do feel like, if you like, the, the, the poor cousin, if you will, in this discussion? And that's something we take responsibility for ourselves and we're trying very hard to make sure that the norms we have agreed to are very practical and understandable to an operational community, wherever you might be. So I think, don't forget, there's a lot of good work that's gone on and be careful what you wish for. Thank you. Thank you. And, and I do think the point well taken about the GGE and its past successes, uh, particularly the 2013-2015 reports, which have um, constructively advanced the conversation. And certainly we should always be careful what we wish for. I think no one would dispute that. So I do think it's an interesting question and I appreciate having a government perspective in the room. So thank you. Um, yes. And um, again, I'm going to, there's a bunch of people in the room that are seeking uh, comments. So I'm asking everybody to keep their interventions as short as possible. Thank, <clears throat> thank you. Richard Hill. Uh, I'm always fascinated by what appears to me a blind spot in this discussion. I, I very much welcome the Microsoft Initiative and support it, but it's reflected in this panel. Nobody has mentioned or even hinted at an institution called the International Telecommunication Union. Uh, some of you here in the room have heard of my friend Tony Rutkowski, well-known provocateur. He's just published the Circle ID article where he points out that actually we've had a treaty involving telecommunications, including the internet, ever since 1865, when it was done for telegraphy. And in fact, the ITU became what we would call today at least a first step towards a multi-stakeholder model because they allowed private sector people to participate in their deliberations as observers since 1875. Now, if states happen to agree, which they don't, of course, we know, but if they agree, the actual provisions that Microsoft is proposing for the treaty would fit very nicely into one of the four instruments of the ITU, namely the International Telecommunication Regulations. As some people know, I'm an expert on that. Unfortunately, there's no will of states to do that. Uh, Australia made that clear, but so have other states and other forums. So to me, it's clear this needs to be a civil society initiative. Those of us who believe it can make it happen. People forget that the Red Cross started as private sector initiative, and then quickly got government support. Uh, we've mentioned the nuclear ban treaty, there have been other ones. So we have precedents, and why don't we think about getting a Nobel Prize for the Microsoft initiative in 10 years? On the attribution side, uh, I think something like the Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies provides a good model. You could think of a federation of the certs, which would then uh, have a body which would be in Geneva and have immunity and would do attribution. Uh, obviously, they wouldn't have any enforcement power. They'd simply publish. They'd say, look, here's a bunch of technical experts. We've looked at the data. We're neutral, and we think it is or it isn't North Korea, or we can't tell or whatever. Now, finally, I can't resist from uh, making a comment to Australia's excellent comment, which is absolutely true, that many states shy away from international norms, and we have lots of examples, including recent ones in Buenos Aires, where civil society representatives were prevented from attending a WTO meeting even though they were accredited. And I'm wondering whether you would include an America First policy as one of the references to states that are shying away from international norms, but I don't expect you to answer that. Thank you. I'm continuing the room, I think um, the woman in the, the middle. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I'd like to pick up on something Paul said earlier about a dollar of offense goes a lot further than a dollar of defense. And I'd like to, to challenge that. Um, so the elements of the Digital Geneva Convention, as has been said, is going to take a long time. You know, there are real problems with attribution and treaties take years to negotiate. But um, you know, Microsoft could improve global cybersecurity tomorrow by addressing weaknesses in its own products and services. And you know, two major cyber attacks that have happened over the years have been enabled by weaknesses in Microsoft products. That's the attack on the Ukraine electric system, which exploited macro functionality in 
Microsoft Office and the WannaCry attack, which raised questions about why very expensive medical equipment in UK hospitals was running on unpatchable Windows XP. So I just wondered, you know, what is Microsoft doing to address the weaknesses in its own products, maybe alongside this? And, and do you really believe that, you know, more should be spent on offense than defense? Thank you. So let me, let me just clarify my comment. When I said a dollar of offense goes a lot further than a dollar of defense, uh, that is something that national security leaders believe because it's easier to attack a product than it is to defend it. And what I mean by that is when you build a product uh, and a product that uh, is, goes under sort of systemic targeting or systematic targeting by people who want to uh, exploit the product, it's almost impossible to, to have a perfect product. You will never have a perfect piece of code. I think what was surprising in the WannaCry event uh, and the NotPetya attacks, uh, you know, with, with WannaCry, you had a, a series of vulnerabilities uh, that the government held on to for a period of time. What we have going on right now is a competition for vulnerabilities. So we uh, produce products, uh, we work with security researchers, we try to understand the vulnerability of our product, but something happens when a product goes out into the real world and people look at ways of exploiting it. The part that concerns me is over time, governments are investing a lot of money in learning how to exploit those products. So uh, before the WannaCry event happened, we released uh, 15 patches there were like 299 for Apache that came out. If you look at like all the companies who had to release patches at one time because of that event, rather significant. Uh, but I think the part about WannaCry that was so stunning was uh, you had sort of the perfect storm of people who were on operating systems that we had deprecated. You know, if you're on XP, oh my God. You, you know, the threat landscape when we designed XP, totally different. It, we made fundamental changes to try to deal with that threat. Some of those things you can't go back and fix. Uh, and so, that, so number one, there's that. If you're gonna play in the modern world, you have to stay up to date and be prepared for modern, modern threats. The second part about that was you had uh, a vulnerability that was not, um, that had been, uh, an exploit had been developed for it. And one of the engineers I worked with described it as, you know, it was like essentially uh, taking a Ferrari engine and putting it in a lawnmower. No, I mean, it just went so fast and so quick and had such really dramatic impacts. It caused great questions about this issue of governments <coughs> holding on to vulnerabilities when the real, in reality, when they're out in the marketplace they, and res re disclosed responsibly, they can be fixed. And that increases defense for everyone. Um, so to your point, totally believe we need more in defense. Um, you know, as a, uh, as a company, we spend a lot of money in defense. Uh, we have lots of engineers devoted to it. But the question I wonder is, as governments ramp up in this space, will they outpace what we can do as the private sector in terms of protecting core products? Thank you. To the gentleman, yes. Hi there. Uh, my name is Andrew Sullivan, um, and I don't speak for anyone, um, but I work for Oracle Dyn, which you might have heard of if you're a Twitter user. Um, we, we um, I, I'm a network operator. I'm not a, uh, I'm not a policy expert or anything like that. And, and, and one of the things that has troubled me a little bit in this discussion is that we keep coming to this question of like, you know, the, um, the effectiveness, the ability to, uh, to understand. Uh, you know, how you're going to apply any rules or, or norms or so on that, that might be adopted. Now, I'm all in favor of governments um, and anybody else for that matter saying that they're going to play nice on the Internet. I think that would be great. But I'm, I'm deeply um, puzzled by the idea that we're going to be able to say, oh, this was state action and this one wasn't. Uh, it, it, you know, when... When the attack that happened on the network of my employer um, a little over a year ago uh, happened, there were, there were enormous numbers of speculation. I, I continue to read speculations about what happened there. Um, I, I read authoritative accounts from people uh, about exactly what happened on my network, and I'm quite sure they're wrong. Uh, and, and I think that this is a, a serious problem in this discussion. You have a lot of, uh, of 
of capability in the hands of pe of people sometimes who are who are just juveniles, right? We saw the Mirai um, authors uh, who 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 pleaded guilty the other day, and you know everybody said, oh, well, this is too sophisticated to be just a bunch of people. It must be state actors or something like that. No, it was a couple of people who who wanted to win at Warcraft. And, and I think that this is an important lesson for us, that, that the, the real question here needs not to be, oh, well, you know, are states allowed to do this thing or that thing or the next thing, but rather what are the correct behaviors for producers um, of, of software, um, for operators of networks, and yeah, for people who are using these things. So I think it would be great if, you know, um, governments, for instance, wanted to come together and affirm what, what it was that they were willing to do or not, and I don't know. It's past my pay grade, whether this ought to be a treaty or norms or anything like that. But, but I, I really caution the people against the belief that like, if you just got a treaty, then you'd have something that would help. Um, because I don't, I don't believe that that's, going to that, that that's going to address anything about the feeling of insecurity that, that you asked about at the very beginning of this session. The feeling of the insecurity at, that you asked about at the beginning of this session is because we have a system here on which we are all really seriously dependent now, and it is not designed to have scaled up in the hostile world in which it lives. And so that's a, that's a, a basic technical design problem that's going to need to be fixed by, um, by protocol changes. It, it can't be fixed by just telling people to behave better. Thanks. Thank you. Um... Just uh, two tweets, uh, just to finalize what I have in mind. I think that we should really move away from a binary approach that either we have a treaty or we have nothing. Uh, if we decide to engage in discussions on a treaty, it doesn't mean that we are going to cross our arms and do nothing for the next 10 years. There are initiatives going on to discuss norms that could be acceptable in cyberspace, and the Global Commission on the Stability of Cyberspace has been mentioned several times. I think that this is something that we can all accept, that the public core of the Internet, the infrastructure that makes the Internet work for us all, should be kept, kept away from, from attacks. So we are working on norms. We just need to, to bring other, other actors on board because we are sort of falling into the trap of a uh, good and evil uh, approach to the world that it's really uh, uh, something that is not sustainable. We cannot talk about security without bringing countries like Russia, China, and India on board. Uh, I completely agree with what the gentleman, uh, gentleman over there just said about uh, fear and the cessation of fear. I think that different actors need to take responsibility uh, for their part and what they need to do. Technical and standards are extremely important, and I agree with the lady over there that uh, private companies need to take responsibility uh, too because a lot of the vulnerabilities that are being stockpiled by states come from, from products that are being designed by private companies and uh, they need to address uh, the rush to put products in the markets, to pour them in the markets before uh, developing the necessary safeguards. So this patch and pray approach needs, needs to end and, and we need to discuss responsibilities and liabilities because of that too. Thank you. needed something to address these microphones. Uh, um, so a couple of key points. I, I totally agree with the comment that, that you made. And, you know, there isn't uh, this idea of having some sort of uh, agreed upon framework is not going to is, is not going to create instant protection. I think it part of it is uh, there are things that have to be done in the private sector in terms of increasing product security. Uh, what we've seen to date is nothing a, a, compared to what we're going to experience with the uh, uh, explosion of IoT and the security challenges that are about to dramatically uh, increase the attack surface. Uh, the other thing we have to, I think, realize is that it's not uh, uh, sometimes that uh, companies just release something uh, and it, oh, it's, it's poor quality. Uh, part of the challenge is you go into a marketplace where you have people who are literally gunning for your product because they're selling that vulnerability. They're making money off of it. There were times when um, you could collaboratively work with security researchers to try to address those things uh, when they discovered them. Now you compete for them with other people, whether they're criminal organizations, armed traffickers, or in some cases government. So there is the, there's an added dimension to this that we didn't have before. Uh, and then the other part is, you know, Tony made a, a great, or Toby made a great point. You know, we are super supportive of the 2015 GGE report 
and the norms that it, that it articulated, this is a powerful, powerful starting point. But that was for 20 countries that participated in the UNGGE process. How do you scale that to a world that's increasing in this space? How do they come on board? How do you start to build that? And I think at some point, as you get into the future, you're gonna need something. And the ideas we put on the table were just that. Let's talk about what the future might look like and, and what are mechanisms that might be helpful. Uh, certainly you have to build norms and you have to build confidence building measures, but at some point we may need something else and we need to think carefully about what that might be with all of the cautions that are, that are put in place in terms of what that looks like. Well, I, I was, and I'm going to make an apology to the remote participants. I think I was going to try and reach them, but seeing we have only three minutes left, I, I'd actually like to try and pause and try and tie together some threads. Obviously, we can have offline conversations of those of you who stayed in the room and participated. I, I mean, my sense here is, is that, it, it, I, again, I think we started at a point of consensus, at least in the room. Uh, I will make the, that the, the, I didn't see anyone standing up and saying, we're, we're good enough where we are, we don't need to do more. Right? And I, I think that, um, that that's a, 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 a positive, that we're all starting at a similar point. I'm also hearing from the room uh, a, a remarkable sense that there is no silver bullet. There's no single solution to the current problems and that there, there has to be both a focus on the norms but also implementation. There has to be a conversation about political will and effectiveness. Uh, and there has to be, you know, a, a conversation uh, about the industry itself and how we can deal with a rapidly changing environment. I, I do think one of the challenges, whether it's a treaty or norms in this space, is how quickly things change, right? I, I used the example of privateering earlier. It, you know, it took a century to, to, you know, ban slavery. It took us decades to deal with uh, nuclear war. It's taken us, you know, a decade to deal with certain specific new technologies. This space is going to require us to act faster because the, the technology moves so fast. And it's a challenge to think about how we're going to regulate it. And so I think part of the, the, the nature of this panel, this workshop, um, has been to provoke and suggest ways we might think about going forward using the Digital Geneva Convention idea as a jumping off point to think about what a world would look like if technology companies could come to some accord on the things they will or will not do to improve our user, as users, cybersecurity, what the world would look like if we had an attribution council that would take, take the current environment where it, I actually do think that there's probably a dozen or more actors out there who are pretty sure they know what's going on, not because they have technical attribution, but because they can combine it with secondary intelligence so they can at least know, state can know when state A can know when state B uh, is engaged, but the rest of us are left in the dark and are, you know, have to read security companies promises that they've figured it out and what a, what a world would look like if we could have some trust in some mechanism that we could get beyond com competition to be the first to claim you know who did it. And finally, I do think that it's an interesting question of where do we go with states and who's involved in the conversation about what states will or won't do. Is the conversation only for states to be had in a state setting uh, because it is a security matter or is it a broader conversation where we want uh, to include multiple stakeholders uh, like the IGF has formulated for some time now and bringing in voices from the academy, civil society, uh, and elsewhere to have a conversation about the way we want this, uh, as Constantino said, you know, this open, free, and secure cyberspace that we have. I mean, you know, uh, we can question where each of, whether each of those are uh, valid now, but certainly they are under threat. And so I, I commend to all of you the question as we go forward in this space we all share is where do we go from here and what's the, what are the future norms look like? But I will stop there, invite you to enjoy the rest of your day, and thank you. And please join me in uh, thanking our uh, participants in the roundtable for their contributions. Thank you.